Welcome. I'm Pam Larickia from livingjoyfully.ca and today I'm here with Nadia Joshua. Hi, Nadia. Hi. Thanks for having me. (laughs) I want everybody to know um, that I have enjoyed following you online for a while now. I follow you mostly on Instagram, so we'll share the link to that in the show notes. Um, But I'm really excited to connect with you almost in person now (laughs) and learn (laughs) about your unschooling journey. So to get us started, can you share with us a bit about you and your family and what everyone's into right now? Yeah, sure. So um, there's four of us, myself, my husband, Sai, we've been married for 10 years and we have two daughters, Amna Rain, who is eight and Maya Rose, who is five. And um, we live in South Wales, um, in the UK, um, by a lovely beach. So we love going to the beach a lot um, when it's nice enough. <laughs> um, or even in the stormy weather, we like the beach too. Um, Sai's recently got a new job. He works for a race equality charity. Um, so that's very recent. Um, before that, he was... He had gotten, um, he was made redundant. So we had six months of him at home, which was really, really nice. Um, but yeah, he's, he's working again now, but he also likes um, videography and flying his drone and his, his technology and his toys. <laughs> um, I love blogging about our unschooling journey and our lifestyle and with the hope to inspire others or help others if they're kind of sitting on the fence or at a crossroad, you know, not knowing what, what they want to do. Um, yeah, so I like, I like doing that. And, um, Amna, she, she's very social. She loves, she's, she's very, um, active, physical. She loves dance. She loves, um, parkour. She just loves anything that's active and physical. And, She's also um, very much a comedian. She loves making people laugh. Um, yeah, always, always pranking us. You know, she's ho- always hiding behind the door when we come downstairs. And, and, and she, you know, if she, if she can get a, a jump out of us, she's happy. <laughs> she, yeah, I'd be she, in trouble um, there because I am very jumpy that way. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and do you know what? She gets that. She gets me almost every time. And you, you think that you, you learn from it, but you just don't because you just you're so preoccupied. And then there she is behind the door. <laughs> um, yeah. What else? Um, she she loves reborn dolls. She's really into her reborn dolls at the moment. Um, and TikTok. She loves TikTok in. Um, and she just likes being independent, you know, for an eight year old, she likes having her independence and, and um, kind of being in control of, of, of her decisions and things. She really appreciates that. And then we've got Maya, who's five, and she's into unicorns and horses and Barbies and role play and storytelling. And yeah, and she's, they're just so different, but um, but yeah, and she's, she's great. She's, she, um, she's, she's exciting in in the terms of she can wake up in the morning and say, hi, mummy, good morning. I want to do this today, you know, and, and then we'll go off and explore in whatever it is that she decides she wants to do that day. Wow, that's so cool. Yeah, it's it is so interesting, isn't it? When when they have the freedom to just pursue what they're drawn to, to see how different and unique and real individual even young kids can be, right? Like they know what they want to wake up and do, right? Even when even when they're young, it's so fun to see the difference. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> she yeah. woke up a couple of days ago and just kind of literally opened her eyes and said, Mummy, I want to go looking for unicorns today. <laughs> <laughs> I want to go to the woods and look for unicorns. So that's what we did. <laughs> <laughs> well, and that too, uh, alongside, I can see how, even though they are very different things, how they can mesh together. Like, so you, you go out to the forest to look for unicorns or you go to the beach and one can be, you know, your youngest Maya can be like in her head and in the story and seeing unicorns 
and Amna can be like running around and parkouring and jumping off all the, the tree stumps and the rocks and running and chasing the water in and out. And like, you can do, you can pursue those things, all those different things, even in, in the same place, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And, and Anne's very sensory as well. So, you know, she's in, she's in the stream, you know, yeah. Amna, uh, Maya found the stream. She's like, there's a clue, Mummy. The unicorns must be near because there's water and they need the water to drink. And, you know, so she found the clue. But then Amna's in the stream, you know, and <laughs> getting her feet wet and, and, and climbing. And yeah, that's really, that's really true. Yeah. Oh, no, that's really cool. Because I think sometimes we can worry, like, especially when they're so different, that we have to be doing different things. Um, you know, oh, we got to spend time supporting the the active one then we got to spend time supporting the quiet one but you know when you give them the space to find what draws them in wherever they are and support them as they're doing that it can be really cool I'm just imagining that would be so much fun hanging out with the two of them (laughs) (laughs) okay so when we connected um you mentioned that when school wasn't working well for Hamna you left your job and you and your husband changed your lifestyle so that you could afford to live off one income so you could stay home. So I would love to hear a little bit more about that story. I think that's something that uh, a lot of families are definitely considering, right? As they start looking at homeschooling and unschooling. Yeah, definitely. When I think back now to two years ago, I just think, wow, we, you know, such a change. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so Amna was Amna had just turned six at the time. I was working part time as a social worker and um, supporting families of children with disabilities and complex needs. I loved my job, um, but I also loved being a mum and being home. And the, the working part time was a good balance. But Amna started developing um, stomach aches in the mornings. Um, you know, she felt sick. She she. She said she couldn't, you know, she was too unwell to go to school. And then that quite quickly led on to her coming home from school, saying that she hated herself and everyone hated her. Her teachers hated her. And I could see quite rapidly her her mental health and and her self-esteem and this bubbly, bright child just diminishing before Mm -hmm. my eyes. So I kind of knew I had to do something about it. And because I was part time, I started flexi schooling um, by just, you know, having a home with me on a Thursday and Friday. But then it quickly became into a kind of an unhealthy situation where I was telling her on a Monday, Tuesday and Wednesday, she had to go to school because I had to go to work. Yeah. And, you know, and it wasn't necessarily because I believed in, I, you know, I realized it's, it's, you don't want to be sending your child to this place. You know that it's unhealthy for her, but you feel you have to. It's a form of childcare because you have to work. And we just, you know, initially we couldn't see a way around it, but pretty quickly I knew that that we had to change it. And um, Sai was a bit apprehensive, you know, how are we going to live off one income? So I just decided, I just started making some changes and I took it upon myself to save my wages for a few months just to see if I could do it. So, yeah, I... Um, I started, um, well, I stopped, you know, eating in cafes and getting the odd coffee and, and just being more conscious about money and, and, and how to save money, you know, being, um, being more organized, making packed lunches, finding places on, on the days where we were together where we didn't have to pay for entry all that kind of thing you know mm-hmm. and it all adds up and then after about um three or four months I, I came back to Sai and I said by the way I've saved all my wages over the last four months and he's like what I was like yeah it's, it's all here you know I haven't spent a thing of it so and during that time as well he was starting to do his own research around homeschooling and um, I, I was being led by you know, like my heart and 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 Amna in the way she was, um, but he was being more practical. So he'd had the time to do his own research. You know, he was he was read, he was reading around education, homeschooling, but also around things like how companies now employ 
people and um you know perhaps not just just you know thinking about the future and what what if they decide they don't want to have an, a, a university degree and how would that look for them if they want to go into the world of jobs you know he just he was thinking differently to me so yeah so that all that was all happening at the same time and um, we were looking to have a, a flexi schooling arrangement with the school but and we looked around other schools as well because we wondered whether it was to do with that particular school but we um after after about four months of knowing that i could save the money and change our lifestyle we we decided to take the full leap and take her out of school wow i love i love how that unfolded for you guys i love that like that and it's totally great and okay that you both came from different came to it from from different uh lenses right so as you said you were following your heart and what you were seeing with your daughter and mm-hmm. after the suggestion your husband was taking a more holistic look at homeschooling in general and and what that may mean for the future right yes even jobs like i mean that that's a big thing right now as well um and entrepreneurship and jobs and you know is is the school kind of the best prep for the world as it as it is now let alone as it's going to be in you know 15 years from now right <laughs> so okay. that, that was so fascinating that what he learned and picked up um was was positive so that he was comfortable moving forward mm-hmm. and what a cool idea you had to save to try and save your your wages right now to see if you could you guys could live at, on that single income i know um i found much much the same things like when when i left i took a leave of absence you know so that it, we we're going to try it out and see if we could we knew how much of our expenses were taken up with supporting me working as it was right so there was some child care and and transportation and gas and like all that stuff that was also going to disappear um and like you said especially when you have that beautiful reason right to have your child Mm -hmm. home with you that's an inspiration to say you know I don't need to stop off and grab that coffee because I know they seem like little bits in the moment, but over over a month even, they they truly add up, don't they? And there is so much to do that doesn't necessarily cost a lot of money. Like you said, there's there's free days. I remember I we got like and then it seems like a lot up front, but we got like a science center pass, but that got us into so many other places for free as well because they had like a reciprocal arrangement with all sorts of other places. You know, when you're opening up your eyes and just open up the possibilities, you know, to see like going to the forest, going to the beach, the kids have so much fun doing that and it doesn't cost money. And when you're more focused on the connection and the relationship, which especially, I mean, forever when you're unschooling, but it's something that you're bringing to the forefront when you're moving to unschooling, it doesn't so much matter where you are right it's that you're together (laughs) it's really that you're hanging out and connecting and doing whatever you guys feel like doing in the moment like and especially with younger kids it's not often so much that they want to do super expensive things they want to hang out they want to run around they want to talk they want to imagine they want to play Right. So it's okay, And I think that's one of the conventional um, kind of pieces to work through is that conventionally we feel like we need to give our kids lots of things to feel that we're, you know, successful, you know, not not in a negative sense at all. But we want that abundance. But to realize that that abundance doesn't need to be things that cost a lot of money. Right. I think mm-hmm. that's one of that was one of my first shifts <laughs> as I moved to this lifestyle was that being together was just as much, if not more valuable than doing things together. Right. Does that make sense? 
Absolutely. And it's, it's amazing as well how quickly, you know, your friends and family pick up on, because I, I stopped buying clothes from you and, and it was something I wanted to do anyway to help the environment and be more sustainable. And, you know, and I, we get so many offers of clothes and things that now pass down for myself and the girls from friends and family, you know, and, and yeah, we haven't bought like new clothes for over two years now. Everything gets passed down from friends and it's, it's so nice to know that, that we've got people's support, but also we're helping, we're helping the environment while also helping ourselves by being able to continue living this lifestyle. Yeah, so. yeah. I mean, that was that was another shift for me too, just because, you know, um, used stuff. I we're talking twenty years ago, <laughs> but yeah, it, it was looked down on, right? That that you know, that was um, a negative thing to be looking at or needing or a compromise is probably, you know, the best way to put it. But no, that shift to realize so many benefits so that it becomes not not a burden. It's like, okay, I'm giving up, you know, buying a lot of new stuff to have my kids home, but it's not a giving up. When you real when you shift and like you were saying, you know the the environment, all these things have great value. Um, you know, clothes that aren't that are still wearable and and things that still function. Like thrift stores are overflowing in our area with all sorts of things, and you know, and my kids help me with that as well. They loved going to thrift stores and hunting things out, and we would find and continue to find like. Because again, this is a lifestyle change, right? My kids are all in their 20s and we still love going thrifty. <laughs> you yeah. know, it really is. It becomes, no, this is this is a great choice. This is a better choice for us, right? It, it's, it is so much, so much of the work when we're making the shift to the lifestyle is, is our internal kind of work to do, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So from there, so you, I have decided, okay, Anna's going to come home. Now you're going, you've left your job. From there, how did you discover unschooling and what did your family's kind of move to unschooling look like? Yeah, so just um, look at my notes. So <laughs> the first six months of homeschooling was just crazy. And I think it's quite a common thing from, I think from what I read in your book as well, you know, we, I signed up to every group going. So I guess all that many that I saved, I was spending on, you know, every single group, I, all every day, the calendar was just chock-a-block. And, you know, we, we were going to gym, we were going to um, science, we were going to like home ed groups, we, um, beach, beach school, forest school, every kind of school you could think of that was not homes, that was not school school. You know, we, we were, I, I had them signed up for everything. And, um, and after six months, I remember saying to Sai, I am exhausted. Like, plus she, Anna had her dance as well that she did. She dances four nights a week. She did um, ballet and street dance, all different styles of dance. So we would go from being out all day to rushing back home to get to the dance class that she was going to. Yeah, and I was exhausted and the girls were exhausted. And he said, he said, take a look at the, that calendar. He said, you know, that's why you're exhausted. I think you might be doing a bit too much. And I was like, hmm, yeah, mm -hmm. maybe. <laughs> so during that time then, um, the good thing about it, I guess, is that we started meeting other like-minded families. And I started hearing things like, body autonomy and I say like, oh what's that and so I go home and research it and think oh okay so maybe I shouldn't be making the girls you know have their hair brushed and, and, and they you know let, letting them choose what they want to wear a bit more and these kind of things and mm -hmm. and then I started hearing about de-schooling and unschooling so I'm like well what's that so I come home and research and then that's when I found your website and your um, free ebook mm -hmm. and then I read that from cover to cover and that was when it just clicked. It just all kind of made sense. And for me, there was no, there was no question about it. It was like, yes, this is what, this is what we want to do. We, we want to be an, an unschooling family. And it was almost like, it was almost like a relief for me because, because yeah. I could see 
already how Amna was starting to become this more autonomous as a person and you know how she was thriving from from just being her and 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 just being able to do things that she wanted to do and and make decisions for herself and then when I found out that it was an actual thing and that you know it, in, in, and it's a kind of a philosophy and, and you can do it not just for education but for, for your life and, and your lifestyle it just made so much sense to me oh I love that I love that that's beautiful and I mean I that was my kind of experience as well it's like you're searching and you're searching and you're seeing what's happening in front of you and nothing is quite yet describing it right? Yeah. You're seeing your kids in action and, and you see what they resist and you see what they flow towards, right? And you see the choices they want to make. And, and when you think about it so often, you don't want to stop, like there's no real reason to stop them, but you're still trying to, that's fighting some semblance of what you thought it was supposed to, like what everybody tells you it's supposed to look yeah. like. Yeah. But what you're seeing and what's making sense to you is different from what you've been told it should look like, right? So when you come across unschooling, I know for me, it was just like, whoa, (laughs) this makes so much sense. There's finally something like you were saying, a philosophy, a way of looking at this that makes sense and, and, and pulls it all together in a way that it's understanding on that bigger level. Like, okay, yes, it's different than what everybody, well, most, most everybody else is saying that it should look like, but it's finally describing what I'm seeing. It's finally describing something that feels good and makes sense to me, right? It's like, like you were saying, it's like, whoa, (laughs) feels like, uh, feels like a weight is released right off you, right? It's just like, oh, look at that. That's amazing. That is what I'm seeing. It makes so much sense to me. Was that kind yeah. of how it felt? Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. And and because we were kind of gentle parent, like what I would say is gentle parents anyway. Mm-hmm. And I learned, you know, and we learned, don't we, so much as parents from our from our children. And I guess, you know, this the sad thing about it for Amna is that she was like the first child, so she had to experience the school and the rules and the boundaries and you know, for me to get to where we got to. Whereas Maya, from from this very start, you know, I, I, I didn't sit in a blacked out room with her and try and put her down for a nap at a certain time because she needed to have a nap time. She just slept whenever she wanted, wherever she wanted. So it was almost like she was already being in school anyway, but without me realising it. So, yeah, it was, yeah. It, it's different for both children. But, but yeah, when you actually realise it is a thing and that pe- other people are doing it and, and you can learn from from others and be inspired from others as well that's that's really nice too yeah yeah no it is it is yeah. fascinating too with the different you know the different ages of your children where you are in your lifestyle like my two oldest did go to school for a while before I found it um, my youngest well a few months um he, he probably remember he remembers a little bit about that but yeah it it is interesting to see that and I think so much especially when you're already gently parenting or attachment parenting, you know, whatever you want to call it, you're more connected. And typically I think many of us are even, even while our kids are still in school, that's why we're being drawn in this. This is why when school isn't working for our kids, we're, we're looking for other answers. We're not just trying to make our kid fit in. We're not just saying kid, sorry, dude, you know, this is the way it's got to be, you know, so we are seeking different ways. So we're already in that different mindset. So I think often our kids are like, like you, you were saying, you know, she's, she's already napping when she's tired um, versus being, you know, nap, trying to nap on a schedule, like all those things. So I think so often it's, it's, it's our I'm not even going to say work, but like when we find it's our release, like for them, it's like, oh, I get to keep living. Like, you know, life didn't change a whole heck of a lot for Maya, right? Between you discovering homeschooling and deciding to stay home and everything, right? Because you were parenting her um, already in that kind of mindset. 
And even for Amna, you know, like you were saying, she was down to three days, three days a week of school. So, you know, she was getting some. So for her, it was just more of what she was enjoying already in her life. Right. So I still the, the biggest change really is for us and how we can um, embrace that. Like you could embrace those Thursdays and Fridays every day of the week now, right? Once you left, you left your work. So, I mean, I do think the biggest change in it is for us because now we don't, you don't go to those Thursdays and Fridays with a little bit of um, guilty pleasure. (laughs) Now now it's like, yes, this is the way we're living. And it's just like, off we go, right? Definitely. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, so um, you discovered unschooling um, through, oh, that was the other piece I wanted to mention. It's, it's very common, I think, when people come to um, homeschooling and even, even unschooling, um, that when they first, you know, release the idea of school, um, it, to be drawn to doing all the, all the classes, you know, the forest school and the bee, because that's still what we know of learning, right? That's still kind of what learning. Mm-hmm. And so you just stick the word school on there and you add a little bit of structure to it. I'm going to, we're going to go specifically look for, for plants. We're going to go specifically learn these things and, and point things out. And it's still, what we come to realize is that's still more adult directed and it's still like, but so often it's a useful transition piece you know I when I look at the unschooling journey it's like we're wanting to still try and keep one foot kind of in each world right because the world we know that schoolish world that's still part of us and we still think on some level that it's um necessary I think as Mm -hmm. part of learning right that the way kids learn and yet the the actual like not classroom piece <laughs> is very important to us. So we've got so we've got one foot in the in the unschooling world, but we're still not quite ready to just fully dive in. And it's it, so it's part of our journey. And yeah, you can find fun things like that, right? The forest school and and the beach school and all the different classes. And that's another thing is when our kids express an interest in something. So often, oh, let's go sign up for a class. You like music? Yeah. You like the guitar? Let's find a guitar class. You know, that's still our first go-to because that structure is still really the only way we see learning happening. So I think I, I'm really glad that you brought that bit up because it is such a common part of the transition from, you know, the school world into the unschooling world, isn't it? And also, I think as well as well as that is the the routine and the structure is like almost still needing that you know from from nine till five you're going somewhere you've got something to do you know and and yeah that and that change as well isn't it from from actually learning can happen any time of the day and it doesn't have to be between nine and five it doesn't have to be that you've gone somewhere and come back from somewhere. I love that. Yeah, no, that's perfect. That's exactly another piece of it too. And I think it's not something that you can, you know, really get through beforehand. You know what I mean? You can't do all that de-schooling while they're in school because you need to see it in action. You need to see Mm -hmm. all those days when you didn't happen to go somewhere that, oh, look at all this learning that still happened. Or, you know, seeing them in the evenings and saying, oh, that's still learning. You know, just to see it happening in all sorts of different environments. It doesn't have to be, you know, uh, a more structured one. You don't always have to be going out for it to be important to them. You know, so having it as part of those first few weeks and months, you know, we really need to see them in front of us and to see them learning. And that's why, to me, it's just really important to be paying attention right? And, and watching and engaging and being with them all the time so that you can see the different kinds of learning that you can see. You can see them at, say, the beach school and, and listening and then maybe not remembering later on, 
or maybe um, not not wanting to follow that, but wanting to, you know, just run back and forth on the beach or just throw things into, into the water, right? Or just look for shells. They don't really want to do what the adult is kind of directing them to do. You know, or, but maybe at the forest school, they love it and they're right there all the time and they're asking questions. Like just seeing learning in action and then seeing it happen in other places too, where it isn't adult directed, when you see them following um, what they're drawn to and still learning, that is just such an important piece of de-schooling, isn't it? Yeah, it really is. It really is. <laughs> I, I, just, I know, I'm just getting excited because I just love seeing kids in action and to realize how important those pieces are for the adult too, as part of the journey. And then you realize that I don't need all that structure. We don't always need to be going out and doing things for us to be productive. And then we start playing with that whole, whole world of productivity and doing, and do we need to do things and the importance of being and downtime and so much value you find in that downtime that they have because they start being drawn places in that time that before they didn't have time to do right because it's like oh okay we're we're going to the beach or we're going here let's go have fun at the museum you know and you that's fun too so they come most often excitedly but there's just so much value in having the space to just like soak into their play for hours too and just to see where it goes right but during that time too, when we when we kind of started slowing down and just staying home more and just like I said, playing and just you know just yeah, just kind of getting to know ourselves. Like I I learned so much too. You know, I even though I always considered myself as a lifelong learner, I always thought of it more as an academic way. And um, but I started to get you know learn. I asked my mum for a sewing machine for Christmas, and I started learning how to sew and. I always thought that I, I always told myself that I wasn't musical and then I kind of you know realized that I was holding myself back through my own mindset so I started and um, learning how to read music and, and started playing the piano something I've always wanted to do but to always told myself that it was too late now I you know I can't do it so so yeah it, it, it was it's, it was such an amazing time and it kind of still is but you know just that that initial discovery and um, of just being home and just having more time to do the things that we we love or we might not even know we love yet but we've got time to explore and and, and try out these things I think that was, was like fundamentally the best part of de-schooling was how I felt the world opened up so much more mm. for me Right. Like I was already doing my best to have for the world to be open for my kids and to help them explore what they were interested in. But like you said, to realize like, oh, you know, my learning isn't done. What I'm interested in isn't worthless because those are messages that we just absorb growing up. Right. Interests are definitely second rate after school and academics. Right. And you have to learn it all while you're in school because, you know, that's the way we learn things. When you're done school, you're done learning, right? So, so many of those messages for us to work through and shed. And then the world becomes so exciting for us, too, in that moment, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I love that. I love that. Okay, so let's talk about um, your de-schooling so and learning more about unschooling. As you were diving in with your with your kids, um, I know we talked a little bit earlier, and you were talking about um, some online unschooling groups that you were a uh, part of, and, and may still be. Um, but that that's kind of that's an intense kind of phase, and there's so many uh, different people in there, different learning styles, different personalities. And you had mentioned that you were more of a question asker. Like when you wanted to know something, you were diving in there with questions. So I would love to hear more about your experience with that. Because I was, I definitely dove into the groups that were around 15 years ago, 20 years ago. <laughs> but I was much more of a reader and I was very appreciative of the question askers. Um, but yeah, I, so I'd love to hear a bit more about that experience from your point of view. 
Sure. Yeah. So, you know, I guess when, you know, this wasn't a planned thing for us. So we kind of learning and, 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 and exploring and figuring it out as we go along. So, yeah, I read your book and then I kind of found these groups online. So I'm like, brilliant. I've got somewhere to go to where, you know, if something happens that day, I can just go on that group and I can just ask a question. And like, I guess that's just kind of my, my learning style as well. And, and I, I, I like having feedback. So, so for me to ask a question, it, it instantly gives me that feedback that I kind of, I need. And, and um, I like thrashing out ideas and, 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 and you know, um, and, and kind of being out loud with my thinking. So to share in my, my thoughts and, 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 and things like that. And, and also making mistakes you know and, and knowing that it's okay to make mistakes so yeah I mean <laughs> I asked a lot of questions and some of them and uh, I would get answers back and it would take me a couple of days to kind of process those answers and and initially I would be like oh no I'm getting this all wrong and oh I'm not cut out for this and but then but then after I kind of got over that initial fear of failure kind of mindset, it was no, you know, I'm learning from from this. So, um, a really funny question um, I asked, and I think I, I think I at times took some of the things I learned about in school in a bit too literal. So, so yeah, I want to share this question. So, <laughs> um, it's around like abundance and we talked about abundance earlier and, and kind of and, and trying to always say yes to our children and and we and the girls kind of got into this phase of, of wanting kind of a new toy quite quite often but they enjoyed going to the toy store so it had to be a certain store they wanted to go to it couldn't it didn't they didn't want to go to the thrift store and they wanted to see the toys and they wanted to kind of it, they you know thought very carefully about what what they wanted and it was a very thoughtful choice and and it was getting quite quite a, a lot and but I wanted to I, I could see the joy they were getting from it and and when they come home playing with the toys but it was getting a bit too much and and I and I was like how do I deal with this situation and and I posted on the group my, the question I posted was something like have you ever bought your children everything they asked for until you run out of money for the month <laughs> that was the question and, and I knew that wasn't what I wanted to do but I didn't I didn't know how else to ask it so I just yeah, came yeah. out <laughs> and yeah uh, got some interesting replies and some people were like I hope that I hope that's not what you think unschooling is that we, you know, we just, <laughs> whenever they want but then I also got some really thoughtful like replies like what what makes you want to do that and it really got me thinking then about again it's like the de-schooling de journey around many and and you know, have always having to be careful with money and budgeting, and and you know, if, you know, just the idea of doing that was liberating almost. But but then at the same time, you know, not 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 being a a lesson, you know, to say, oh, you know, you spent all our money now, it's your fault because all our money's gone because you wanted all these toys. And I think that's what some of the some of the parents thought that I was trying to do and there was lots of perspectives coming back at me which was really helpful for me to kind of thrash out my thinking around it and and, and to come up with um uh come up with um a strategy I guess for dealing with with them wanting to buy toys almost every day <laughs> <laughs> okay so first just to let's close that loop, you know, for there may be some new unschoolers listening for whom that is, is a question on their mind now. So how would you kind of answer that question nowadays? So if, well, if, if I was the person answering that question, yeah. um, I guess I would, um, there were, there's, a few there's a few different ways I guess you can do it. And, I, it's, and it all depends on the child as well. Um, so some people like to su to suggest having a budget so that you know the child gets kind of an allowance and they can and if there's something they really like and they really want and um, we could maybe make a jar with the name of that toy if we can't buy it straight away we can say I can say I know how much you really want this so let's you know save your save so many uh, each week until we can get to the point where we can we can buy it um 
so yeah it's not a um we don't have yeah, to say it? Yeah, one of the things you learn from asking questions in an escalate group is there's no answer <laughs> yeah <laughs> because like you said with unschooling context matters there's no one right answer context super matters it's our kids right and we're working and together with our children so personality matters like processing like you said you're an external processor right so when something happens you wanted to get that out there to process it with other mm. people and get feedback you know, whereas for me, I'm an internal processor. So I like to have the experience, see what happens and then process that for myself. And then, you know, I would come up with the way that I see it, like a perspective on it, a story about it that works and makes sense for me, you know, and then I would share that sometimes and see, you know, is there another angle that you see? Is there something so often I'd be like, is there something I'm missing? would be my kind of, so like I process it, I come up with the way I see it, and then I would ask if there's something I'm missing. Whereas you as an external processor, this is what happened, you know, what what do you think about that, right? And you'd be processing it with people. So I just, yeah. I just love that piece um, and understanding too. And I love that you saw it because so often, even for external processors, I, you know, I'm just sitting here thinking even, I wonder if it's even more so for an internal processor. That's why we don't go there at the beginning, but it can feel like the answers, like you were saying, I feel like I'm doing all this all wrong. Maybe I'm not cut out for it, but to, to, to not stop there, to not take it personally like that because, and, and it can feel, I think um, years in those groups, people can feel attacked with those answers, but that's not what they're trying to do. Like experienced unschoolers sharing these questions, like why would you want to do that? Well, you know, they're sharing those questions and those act reactions to help you, yeah. to help you with that process. They're trying to, to suggest areas to look at for you to keep processing, to think about what you were about the situation. They're trying to help you learn new ways to look at things, right? So I love that, that, and then you get to that point, not only for your children, but you, for yourself, there's no mistakes. Their experiences and what we can learn from them, <laughs> right? Cause I mean, they, they happened, right? These things happen. We made our best choice in that moment, like from the context and what we think our children were wanting to do and what we were wanting to do for them and with them you know, and, and we made a choice, like you, you can be okay with a choice, any, the choice that you make, but yeah, now you want to learn from it because you know what, that felt a little off. I didn't really like how it worked out or, you know, whatever felt off that motivated you to come and bring the question to um, the group, a group in the first place. Right. So, mm -hmm. so fascinating to see all that play out. And then, yeah, when you can, separate that the the questions that you get back and the the answers you know like oh well you could try this and try this back to that's where I started right there's no one right answer because like like you were saying when you tried to answer the question right then you know made for some kids and parents uh, uh an allowance of some sort so just like regular money that's not attached to having to do something right this is your money to play with, you know, because then they learn about money. They learn how it works. They learn, you know, that's the different values of things. Like sometimes they're, they allow us the money they have in their pocket will buy what they're interested in. And sometimes it won't. And then there's discussions about saving and how we can, you know, maybe it is a jar and it's like, you know, whenever we find we have a little bit of pocket change, we throw it in there because we know that's what we're all trying to get right now the extra piece or you know whatever it is budgetary wise but yeah then the budget comes into the conversation right so it's not because if we just keep buying stuff there's no understanding of the context of that of you know mm -hmm. the family has oh, so much money and so many fixed expenses so to have little conversations here and there about that 
so that they're learning more about how their purchases fit into the whole family ecosystem, right? So, and and those are done at when at, I'm thinking about their age, right? So there's different conversations at different age levels and you get into different aspects of it. But even at a young age, it can be like part of the conversation. Oh, we don't have money for that right now. But, you know, you've got this much. I've got this much in my pocket. Then we just, we need this much more. And so maybe by next week or in two weeks or, you know, whatever the conversation piece is that way. And then as they get a little bit older, then it's like, you know, maybe you can find extra work, maybe like around the house that that they can do for extra money or, you know, little neighborhood things like there's just a whole world of possibility inside that question, isn't there? <laughs> and Anna now, you know, she if she really wants something, she will um, look at what she, she's look at what she's currently got and she'll and she she might say, oh, mom, I don't really play with this much anymore. I think I might try and sell this and then I can make money towards getting the next thing that I want, you know? And so she's already thinking that way. And Yeah. yeah. No, it's just when you're open and you don't just like the answer, no, we don't have the money for that. And then, and our fear, and we want to shut them down and we want to distract them. No, look, you've got all these other toys you, that, that we bought, you know, over the last six months, play with all these other toys. You know, look how you've just closed down that conversation, right? Whereas they can be thinking about the value and thinking, oh, you know, yes, I'm not playing with that this much. Maybe we can find a way to sell them. Maybe we can have a garage sale. You know, there's just a million ways there to not take, um, no, we can't afford that as a judgment of yourself. Feel bad about it and then try to um, change the subject and not talk about it again because we feel bad about it. That mm -hmm. really doesn't take anything anywhere, does it? There's, there's, that's just no. frustration, pound into a pot, lid twisted on and try to keep it closed. Whereas like the whole world is out there and it's okay to not have the money to afford something in that moment. But with, you know, that open possibilities, that more abundance mindset, maybe you guys find something else that's so similar and not as expensive. Like there is just a million possibilities to any particular given situation, isn't there? And that's why I asked the question because I, you know, I, I knew I didn't want to have that closed down conversation with them and that, you know, that well, you've got too many toys already kind of kind of mindset. But yeah. I didn't know I didn't know yet what my other options were. So that's where the question came from. But it, I think it was just the question that was asked was quite, quite an emotive question. But um, but yeah, and I'll tell you, it was definitely there. <laughs> there will have been a few hundred other people that really appreciated that you asked that question. Oh. <laughs> oh yeah no I mean I remember when I I would soak up those groups I would read all the time um but I wasn't the one asking the questions you know so the groups were busy by the external processors the ones who wanted or even you know like I was saying the internal ones who are like okay did I miss something this is the way it makes sense to me is there something I'm missing about the situation you know and what was super valuable is also reading questions, you know, um, from moms with kids younger than mine, kids older than mine, you know, who are wanting or interested in things that my kids aren't interested in in the moment. The wide range of experiences and the, um, the comments and the answers and stuff from those helped me better understand unschooling in the wider world. Like, so it helped yeah. me see that that lens of unschooling, right, that framework, it helped me understand it so much better to see how it applied in so many other situations rather than just specifically my own, right? It helped me mm -hmm. better understand how unschooling works so that when I came across a new un, uh, situation in my family, you know, as my kids got older and they tried different things, I had a much better sense of that lens and could figure out how that would work for us. Because like, like we've been saying this whole call, it's not exactly the same for every family. Unschooling isn't a, an answer, a single answer to anything. 
but understanding like through uh, other people's situations, all the different ways you can look at it, all the different questions you can ask to narrow in on how it might work for us. Oh, it's just invaluable. I mean, and it's why I love doing the podcast. We're, you know, we're well over 200 episodes now, so many different families. It looks different in each one, yet the foundation, the heart, the lens of unschooling is there in all of them. So it's, it's yeah. just a wonderful way to learn, isn't it? Right? For hearing from I'm just so thankful for yeah, for like, you know, people who wanna who wanna help and you know give up their time to have these groups and podcasts and things. Well yeah, and, and like you're enjoying doing right now, right? You're sharing mm-hmm. for for your family what things are looking like for you. And you're still deep in the the learning about unschooling. Your kids are still, you know, eight and five. You know, and it's wonderful that you're enjoying um, putting in the time to share that bit, those pieces and how you see them and and what comes up for you guys uh, as part of that just shared experience out there. Because I think we can feel really lonely, can't it? Because, yes, we seem like a lot of people when you look online because that's one place where we can congregate but around us, you know, we, it's not that most families, if any, you know, close nearby us are unschooling. So to be able to share these experiences online and to know that we're not alone in making these choices to live this way, I think it's super valuable. So thanks for for adding your voice to it. <laughs> All right, so I am curious to know what has been one of the more challenging aspects. I know we talked about the the money question, which was awesome. Um, one of the more challenging aspects of de-schooling for you so far, and I'd just like to hear a little bit of how you've worked through that. I, when I looked at this question, there was there was two there were two really challenging things that I wanted to <laughs> talk sure. about. That's and one of them. One of them is like it's kind of, sort of thread, I guess, from what, what I've been saying so far. But I think because for me, when when I when I read your book and it was such a like an aha moment and a yes, this is this is kind of it, it it, 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 it was almost a, a thin line between de-schooling and unparenting. And and I I I, I kind of I think I I, pick, I picked up on it quite quickly and became aware of it. But an example, I guess, would be um, like Amna, you know, like I've, like I've said, she's she's wanting to be the decision maker for her own self. And and I guess one of the things was she she stopped wanting to brush her teeth. She went through a phase of not wanting, wanting to brush her teeth. And um, and rather than be like, no, you have to brush your teeth. That's a hygiene support and blah, 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 blah. I was like, OK, if you don't want to brush your teeth today, that's fine. But then I started... I started to stop encouraging them to brush their teeth. And I started to stop saying things like, I'm going to go brush my teeth now, or shall we go brush our teeth? You know, and it was almost like, um, I, I kind of stopped myself and thought, hang on, you, you, you don't have to force her to brush her teeth, but at the same time, she is only six. You know, you can kind of encourage her or say, well, let's brush our teeth together. You know, you don't have to completely stop. And I, so for me, that was a kind of a challenge because it was almost liberating to say, oh, I don't have to do all these routines and these, you know, you have to do this and you have to do that anymore. But at the same time, it's not like just let your children get on with it and bring themselves up, you know? Oh, <laughs> Does that I make sense? That. That's such a great observation. And I think, I think, again, that is something that so many people find um, when they're de-schooling because... So often the first thing you discover is like, oh, yeah, that's why those rules didn't feel good, right? And were very frustrating to try and uphold. So the first thing you kind of do is like, okay, back off those, but you haven't yet discovered what to replace them with yet, right? So that's why I'm always like, keep going on the journey, keep going. Don't just like, ha! Like, I, I don't have to do all those rules, right? I don't have to force them to do things. And then you step back. And like you said, that that's, if you stay there, that's where the chaos comes. That's where kind of the unparenting um, comes in because you're not connected with them anywhere. You're just stepping back and saying, okay, this is your life. You lead it. 
And, and then, you know, that, that's basically it. I'm going to go off and do my things over here. You know, come ask me if you have something you need or you need me to drive you somewhere. That's no, it's, it's that the next step is that connecting again and living life together and being together and, and them seeing the things that we do in our life and doing them together. Like you were saying, if it, it, but again, it's not stepping back into the rules, but it's stepping back into that connection and them seeing, you know, that, that we eat when we're hungry, that, you know, we brush, we brush our teeth, we have a bath or a shower, like not have as in, so the difference is we're coming back to it, but not with our timetable, not with our, our rules around it, not like, oh my gosh, you need a bath now and then you spend the next two hours trying to politely convince them to get in the bath no having an agenda of getting them in the bath it's the agendas that we can get that we can get rid of right that we can drop because that's basically a rule that you're just trying to politely implement (laughs) yet being open and being connected there will be times when the bath flows in you know they notice that they're dirty oh you know let's wipe that or let's have a bath um, I'm going to brush my teeth. I, you know, I enjoy brushing my teeth at night or in the morning or whenever after I eat, you know, however it flows. And just them seeing that these are the aspects of your life that are happening, you know, they they want to live too. You know, they're they want to engage in the things that their parents engage in, right? See what life is really like. Like if we're too separate, they don't see what everyday life looks like right? You're just kind of leaving them to their own devices to figure it out. And like you said, they don't have a lot of experience. They don't know. They don't have a model or an example close by with them. It's it's the agenda of the timetable of it that we can yeah. drop, right? Because that is just something that we've adopted. And maybe we've adopted it very thoughtfully because it's what works for us, right? We know it works, but the the shift now is realizing we want to help them discover what works for them but to know that it exists by living together and seeing that we're choosing what works for us you know whether it's shower every other day and you know I brush my teeth in the morning because that's when I like to do it uh, you know there's just so many pieces to like oh I'm hungry right now I'm gonna eat. like you were saying just explaining our lives as we go about them so they can see the things that we think about, how we process, how we make choices, and they have the space to figure out how they like to make choices, what considerations. That's even, you know, gives them cues to check in with themselves for a moment. Am I hungry? Am I thirsty? You know, what is it that I do want to feel like doing? You know, and as they get older, you know, what do I want to wear? You, you know, as, as they get older, those, those questions and the things they want to consider um, grow, right? And it's just, oh, I, lo- I love that point. It's, it's, it's so much a part of the journey. It's that, okay, I want to release. I know what I don't want to do. But then you have to get to the point where here, I want to come and connect with them and be with them. You've got to replace. Like I, I often talk about it from the parenting side it's it's that shift from control to connection so so often we're starting more from a controlling place um even even with you know a gentle parenting attachment parenting um as they get a little bit older as they start hitting school age we start having expectations of them so that control is kind of like the expectations that we want them to meet of ours if control sounds too harsh <laughs> but no, yes, but it, yeah when you drop that And then it's coming back to the connection that you replace it with instead of that vacuum of nothingness, right? Yeah. I love telling a story, just kind of a little bit off topic, but same thing about, um, I always thought that I taught Amna everything. She's my first, you know, I give her all my time, all my attention. And I thought I taught her how to do things. You know, I taught her how to walk and talk and all these things. And then Maya came along and um, I remember she was sat on the floor. She, she could only, she'd only just learned how to sit up and she was sat and she spent most of her, her life, her baby life in a wrap, you know, in a, in a baby carrier because 
because Anna was only three and she was very active. And so Maya kind of spent all her time in the shrap. And then she can suddenly be able, she was suddenly able to sit on the floor. And I think I was cooking or doing something and I looked over and, and she was clapping her hands, Maya. And I just stopped and I thought, how, how can you do that? I haven't taught you how to do that. I haven't done clapping hands with you yet. And I was like, oh my gosh, she, she, she taught me. I, and then I was like, right, so all those things that Anna could do, I didn't teach her. She just did it because she was ready to do it. And it was like, it was like a massive eye opener for me. <laughs> I love that. I love that. That's awesome. What a great, great example, right? Like that is a perfect aha moment. <laughs> so you said you had two story, two bits that you wanted to share? Oh yeah. So the second one is connection. And I wanted to share it because I don't want parents who are like de-schooling to beat themselves up too much about it. Because even though we, you know, I was very much, like you said, gentle attachment parenting style, I still found that really connecting and switching off from everything else and really being in the moment really difficult um like for Amna it was certain tv programs that she loved watching and there was a one part of your book that that was really helpful for me and um where you know I don't know if it was about Spongebob or something for you but for us it was a, a, a program that she watches that used to really I, it was difficult because it had that canned laughter and I and I never used to like it and and then, and then after reading your book, I sat with her and I, I, listened, I watched the show with her and I asked the questions and I, and I asked her, you know, what is it about the show that you love or what, what, what are they doing? What's your favourite character? And I, and I started to learn watch her, a bit more about her personality as well, what she liked about it, what she found funny about it. So it, I think it takes time to build that connection. And, and with Maya, even now, still, you know, when she wants to play Barbies or ponies every day, and I know that there's other things that I've got to do. I, I, I have to work really hard to switch off from those other things and be in the moment with her. And, and what I love about it is she knows. So she she can give me cues if, if it's like, come on, ma'am, you're not really playing. And I'm like, yeah, you know, I need to switch off and really connect. So I think it takes practice and it takes time to to yeah. do it so, yeah no I love I love that point because it is very true it's not something that you can just um just do all of a sudden right I think it's got layers to it like like mm. the realization you said oh um I wasn't really watching the show with her like I was okay with her watching the show but that's it. Like, I think that that comes into so many of the questions around screen time, right? You know, mm -hmm. as soon as somebody just uses the phrase screen time, there's still more layers to go in because, number one, what is the show that they're watching? What is it that they're enjoying about it? And like you said, all those things take time, right? And and the joy of going in there and you learning those little pieces of her personality, like what it is she's actually connecting to in that show and getting out of that show. Oh my gosh, now you know so much more about her. Now that root of what she's enjoying, it's not like the show. You know, even in, you know, if it, it, it can be, um, like I don't want you to not enjoy the show itself, but the pieces inside that she's enjoying a about the shows like you can bring more of that into their life and maybe yeah. maybe it is through different shows it's like oh that sparks another show but it could be through games it could be through like other books like when you find the root like is it that she loves the relationships between characters um then you get other story find other stories with those kinds of deep relationships or maybe it's the humor okay so now I'm going to find funny other things, maybe funny movies, maybe, you know, funny stories again, like what, if it's the art, then maybe you're getting art books out in that same art style. If it's a cartoon, like there is, there's a whole world inside that show, isn't there? And until you connect with them and hang out and really see what it is they're enjoying, that's when you can expand their world. Right. Rather than just okay. saying, Oh, She's watching SpongeBob again, and I'm going to go wash the dishes because she's engaged with SpongeBob, and then later on worry about screen time. 
You know what I mean? There's yeah. there's a whole world and absolutely it takes time. First that time for us to to realize the value of it and the importance of it and to shift off and say, you know, the dishes or whatever, whatever, we'll wait. They'll still be there in half an hour. But here's an opportunity for me to deeply connect with my child, you know, playing Barbies again, you know, and, and sometimes we can't do it forever and ever. Absolutely. And you find other ways. Um, but to be in the moment, I love that Maya just said, Hey mom, you're not all here. <laughs> and our kids will do that. Like, that's why I love the metaphor of our kids as our guides, because they are so good at being in the moment, right? They are so good at dropping all the other things and truly being there. So using them as our guide to really being in the moment and meeting them there and connecting with them. And then when you come out, you're like, oh my gosh, that was just so valuable. I learned so much, like even just from the dialogue that she's and the situation that she's putting her Barbies in, you know where her mind is. You can, as, as the story develops, you can see what she's thinking about and processing and you just learn so much, which helps you connect more deeply with them the next time as well. And our kids are just awesome when we learn and understand them at that level, at that deep level. It just makes you want to hang out with them more, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but that that is such a great point. Like, and that's why so often we talk, you know, when you're coming to unschooling, it is so great if you can just give it, I like, the, you know, six months to a year at least, where you're like, okay, we're just going to dive into this and see where it takes us because you need that time. You need that time to make those connections. You need that time to see things unfold to see a few interests, to see some connections play out, to get that relationship um, developed, right? To see different seasons in action. Like you need that chunk of time to really come to understand unschooling and to trust it and to see it in action in your family. So that time um, is really invaluable, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. <laughs> yeah, no, that's wonderful. All right, so I would love to know what's the favorite thing about the flow of your unschooling days right now? Yeah, it, it was, it's kind of hard to answer this question because life is a bit different, isn't it, at the moment with lockdown yeah. and not being, you know, being restricted on what we can do and stuff. Yeah. Um, yeah, so it's not, it's not, life as it usually is but you know what I love about our days is being able to wake up when our bodies have had enough sleep um you know we co-sleep and I'm I still breastfeed Maya so we we I I I, I need to like at least eight hours sleep so I just love how we can just go to sleep when we want and wake up when we want and start our day when we're ready to start our day mm-hmm. and like that for me just is I just love that you know and then, like I said to you earlier, you know, when Maya can wake up and have an idea in her mind, a quite vivid idea of what she wants to do that day, we can just pack a bag and go off and do it. Um, so, so yeah. And um, what else? And just like learning how they learn. And like my Amna, she she's a, she's a bit of a night person. Her, all her creativity comes out at night, and she starts asking questions, and she starts wanting to to design and, and do things like late at night. It's almost like as soon as the sun goes down, that's her time to mm-hmm. really start being creative and just just being just knowing that she can do that because we don't have to get up and go anywhere in the morning, you know, most days unless we've got something planned. Yeah. And um, I just love that freedom, you know, just to kind of just to do what we want to do and when we want to do it. I love that. Yeah. And it's it is so fascinating when they have that space to, like you were saying, she gets more creative in the evening. Like, imagine if you were trying to fit into a normal schedule, right? That you wouldn't be able to, like, eat, maybe not even notice that. It would just be, this would be more frustrating because you'd be trying to shut it down, trying to shut it down so that she could get to sleep. But seeing how naturally that comes to her you know, in the evenings when the sun is down and that you can support that and just how individual, like 
right down to our personalities and and where when we're energized and when we're feeling creative and when we're feeling introspective and just seeing again back to the time component right having the time to see how all those pieces flow through their lives is it's just so fascinating to watch them in action isn't it mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah yeah we just love we just love going to the beach and you know being out and seeing people and yeah we're looking forward to the restrictions um um i think they're starting to slowly ease off now so we can we can hopefully start meeting up with some friends as well you know and yeah, no, it, that's an interesting time. You know, the, these last few months have been, you know, super interesting. And it it has been definitely a change in, you know, with, with the restrictions on, you know, for some families, the change is much bigger than others, especially, you know, if you have more extroverted kids, you have kids who like to be out and engaged with other kids, you know, it's a, it's a hard time to try and manage that. And then even, you know, the more introverted still may be liking to go places. So it's definitely um, a, a challenging time to move through our days without those pieces that, that we've enjoyed having as part of our lives. So, yeah, I really appreciate, you know, that there's a difference. It's, it's not, you know, life as usual just because school is closed and it wasn't a part of our lives anyway. No, we're still, you know, out and about in the world and things even you know, very introverted parts, people among us, right? So I, I appreciate that, that note and, and the difference in, in our, our lifestyles, right? Yeah. 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 But you guys will be looking, it'll be interesting too, as things, things are starting to open up here as well, but they're opening up differently. So it's not like life back to the way it was before either. So that's a nice, mm. the nice thing for us in that, you know, we're always having conversations with our kids. We're always trying to figure out ways to make things work. It's not just yes, no, you know, there's figuring out how, con- back to context again, you know, how we're going to navigate it. What's, what's going to be open, how it's going to look like, you know, briefing and organizing ourselves kind of before we get there. So they know what to expect, all those yeah. little pieces of the puzzle, right? <laughs> Yeah, and they lead to great conversations as well, don't they? Like great, you know, great questions that the the girls ask. Well, why is that? Or what's going to happen if that happens? And yeah, yeah, that's being together, right? Living together. All those kinds of conversations come up, and and I love that you because we know our kids well, like you know, so it's not like generic conversations, generic answers again. I think there, there's our, <laughs> our thread through everything, you know, how individual everything is, but that we can, you know, because we know them and especially when you've built that connection to, uh, and so you better understand where their mind is. You, it's, it's easier. It helps us phrase things in ways that will connect and be understandable for them. Right. Mm-hmm. The way the picture we paint when we tell them, you know, try to explain kind of what's going on, we can do that in their language and the way that connects with them because we know them so well. It's not, I got to go look up a website on how to talk to kids about this. You know, that might be helpful too, but it's only one piece of the puzzle. You know, you may go looking for that and say, oh yeah, they, you know, mentioned this, this, and this. And then that just becomes part of our fodder when we go to connect with them, it's not a regurgitation kind of thing, right? Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. <laughs> oh, well, well, I must say, it's been so much fun chatting with you, Nadia. We went in a whole bunch of different directions, but I just just love the thread that went through it all. And thank you so much for sharing your de-schooling story so far. It was so fascinating to hear about it. Well, thanks for having me on. I just noticed as well that it says Sai on my on the screen, but that's my husband's name. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, yeah. Thanks for having me. Before we go, where can people connect with you online? Yeah, so um, I've got my own website, which is um, www.justdoingus.co.uk. 
Um, but also I, I blog a lot on Instagram and it's at Josh Doing Earth. So J-O-S-H-D-O-I-N-G-U-S. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and I will put the links to both those in the show notes. Thanks again so much, and have a wonderful day, Nanya. Thanks, Tom. Bye. Bye.